So hello everyone. Uh, today is another round of seminars for today is Neutron Beam Delivery 3. My name is Fernando Alvarado. I'm a first year PhD student here at ILL. And today I will give the summer seminar alongside with Dominique, which will do the second part of the seminar today. So for my presentation, I will talk about polarized neutrons, about how we can polarize a neutron beam. Uh, I will explain a little bit about flippers and how we can use uh, the polarized neutron beam and the flippers in polarized neutron scattering. So if we start talking about neutrons, neutrons, as we've seen uh, in other seminars, have a spin of one half. They have an associated spin angular momentum of plus or minus one half and a magnetic moment. And what this means is uh, the neutrons have a spin up or spin down in relation to the direction of the field. I will mostly refer to the direction of the spin as parallel or anti-parallel to the direction of the field, because if the field is horizontal, then the spin up and spin down relation becomes confusing. So they can either be parallel or anti-parallel to the direction of the field. And the way that we can know if our neutron beam is polarized or not is given by this relation, where we have the number of neutrons with a with a spin parallel to the direction of the field, which is n plus, a number of neutrons with a spin anti-parallel to the direction of the field, which is n minus. So in this simple relation, which will be right now only for one axis, in this simple relation, we can say that our beam is polarized if p equals one, and the beam, the beam of course is not polarized if p equals zero. Now, it is also important to mention that there is a difference between magnetic and nuclear neutron scattering. For magnetic neutron scattering, it relates to the interaction of the magnetic moment of the atoms, so as in with the unpaired electrons of the atoms with that of the neutron, whereas nuclear neutron scattering relates to the interaction between neutron and the core potential of the atomic nuclei. And Magnetic and nuclear neutron scattering come always together, and this is one of the reasons why we're interested in magnetic neutron scattering, so that we can uh, separate the effects of both interactions. So the first question is, how can we polarize our neutron beam? And this can be done using either polarizing crystals, polarizing mirrors or super mirrors, or using polarizing filters. So I will first explain how do polarizing crystals work? So polarizing crystals uh, simultaneously polarize and monochromatize the neutron beam. They have a differential scattering cross-section that is given by this equation, where it's important just to keep in mind that it has a contribution from the nuclear as well as from the magnetic uh, structure factor. And if we apply a permanent magnetic field, in this slide will be referred to as H, if we applied a magnetic field in the crystal, then the form factors will be the same and the reflected beam will be polarized. And to show it a bit more clearly, so if we have our, if we have our crystal and we have it under a magnetic field, then the incoming incident beam uh, will come with neutrons with, with several spin states and only the desired spin state will be refracted, diffracted from the crystal. And this is a way, one of the way that we can uh, polarize our neutron beam. The polarizing efficiency of the crystals is given by this relation, by the multiplication of the structure factors over the sum of the square of both of them. And examples of polarizing crystals are copper iron crystals, which is of around two or three millimeter, has a thickness of around two or three millimeters. It has a relatively high absorption and it has a positive polarizing efficiency, meaning that the spins will be polarized parallel to the direction of the field H. Whereas the Heusler alloy uh, has a higher reflectivity and renders a negative polarization, as in the spin, the neutrons will be polarized anti-parallel to the applied magnetic field. Now, the second example of, of a beam polarizing would be that of the polarizing mirror. 
So when we talk about polarizing mirrors, we need to talk about the neutron refractive index, which is given by this relation, which it involves N, the number density of scattering nuclei, and the coherent and magnetic scattering length. We can also talk about the critical glancing angle, which this will be important to calculate uh, how can we have total reflection within our mirror. And it is given by uh, one minus one half of the critical angle squared. So if we if we combine these two these two equations, then we can get a spin dependent refractive index uh, for a defined neutron wavelength, which will be lambda. So this will set the limits in which the the beam needs to enter the mirror, as in uh, the the critical glancing the critical angles by which the beam will be fully polarized within the mirror. A limitation of the mirrors is that they have small critical angles of typically 10 arc minutes, which this means that we would we need long devices to polarize a wide beam. For example, for a beam that is two centimeters wide, the mirror must be several meters in length. Now, of course, we want to optimize this. So this is our constraint, and we want to optimize our mirrors for which I would like to introduce uh, the reflectivity, the reflectivity of a multi-structure polarizing mirror. Uh, and when I say multi-structure, I mean a mirror that has alternate magnetic and non-magnetic layers. The reflectivity is given by this relate by this equation, which uh, include the number of atoms in the layers and the coherent and the magnetic scattering length. So, if we choose the materials properly and have defined thicknesses, then we can render a reflectivity of zero for one of the polarization states of the neutrons. And what does this mean? This means that if we choose our materials properly, then, and we and we have our incident neutron beam, then the, the neutrons with a certain spin state will be reflected along the mirror, whereas the neutron with the, uh, the neutrons with the other spin state will be absorbed within the mirror and they will not go through. Um, when we, so when we talk about simple mirrors, uh, we have a reflectivity that is constrained by the critical angle. So the reflectivity is, is uh, really, really low. Whereas when we talk about super mirrors, uh, when we talk about mirrors with different layers that have gradual uh, thicknesses, then we see that there's a broad range of reflectivity along different angles, and this helps to further to increase the polarization of the beam. Another way to increase uh, the reflectivity will be with a Newton beam bender. And the Newton beam bender, like the one shown in this picture, will ensure that all the neutrons are reflected at least once during the mirror, along the mirror. Now let's talk about also polarizing filters. So polarizing filters uh, remove one of the spin states and allow the others uh, allow the other spin state to be transmitted. As it says, it's like a it is literally like a filter. In polarizing filters, we have an efficiency that is given by the transmittance of the two spin states. So here again, T plus is the transmittance of the spin of of the spins that are parallel, parallel to the field, whereas T minus of the spins that are anti-parallel to the field. And we also have then a relation with the transmittance that is given by the sum of the transmittance of the two spin states over two. And what does this mean? That we have a relation between the, uh, the polarizing efficiency of our, of our filter at the cost of having less transmission. So if we want to have a polarization of one, our transmittance will be really small. And this is why we need to calculate when we choose the filter or design the filter, we need to keep in mind the quality factor of our, of our filter, which will, be the, which will be the polarization efficiency times the square root of the transmission. And here in this graph, it is shown, the quality factor is shown as the dashed 
curve with dashed lines. And the optimum polarization of the filter should be chosen at the peak of the quality factor. A concrete example of a spin filter is the helium-3 uh, filter. So helium-3 nuclei can be polarized by optical pumping using high power lasers. The helium gas is then compressed. And by this compression, we can optimize the transmission to absorption ratio of the filter. And again, here to uh, show it in a small scheme, uh, one neutron spin is almost transparent for the filter, whereas it is uh, absorbing for the other spin state. And this is why when we pass our neutron beam along the filter, then we only have uh, left one of the spin states and we have our neutron beam polarized. Here are examples and pictures of, uh, of two helium-3 filters. The first one, the one to the left, the helium-3 cell at D17 at ILL. And the one to the right is a helium-3 cell that is used for time of flight experiments. Now at ILL, uh, we can say that there is sort of like a mass production of polarized helium-3 in the so-called Tyrex filling station. So uh, polarized helium-3 is, uh, is, helium-3 is polarized, sorry, in this filling station with a polarization of more than 80%. And it produces 1.5 bars per hour of polarized gas. And so from this, station, the polarized gas is transported through magnetic shields and decanted into the polarizers of the instruments so that they are ready to be used at the instruments. There will be a newer version of this Tyrex 2. It's still not in place, but it, it will be, it will come, uh, which will have a higher production capacity of polarized helium 3 and will require less maintenance than the Tyrex, the actual Tyrex station at the Institute. So we've talked about how we can polarize the Newton beam. And now I want to also introduce uh, the spin flippers. To introduce the spin flippers, I would like to briefly talk about uh, the Larmor precession. This will be also addressed in Dominic's talk, but I would like to, uh, to introduce it so that we can talk about how we can rotate the polarization within the, within the, the Newton beam. So when we apply a magnetic field, in this case, it's going to be denoted as B. When we apply the magnetic field, it exerts a torque on the magnetic moment. It's a cross product of the vectors. And this will cause uh, the magnetic moment to precess around the direction of the field B. So what this means is that the polarization will rotate around the field with a certain frequency, which is known as the Larmor precession frequency. The Larmor precession frequency, which is given in this in this relation at the bottom, it's in kilohertz is 2.916 times 10 to the 10 to the power of minus four times the magnetic field, and this means that yes, then we have to keep in mind that then the polarization rotates along along the field, the direction of the field. And then, so if we change the direction of the field, we can change the direction of our polarization. For this, there are two different ways. There are two things that can happen when we rotate our field. And for this, we're gonna talk about adiabatic and non-adiabatic transitions. So if we have our incident beam, and we have an applied an applied field that is denoted here as B, the blue the blue arrow. And we change the direction of the field slowly. Then the neutrons will align according to the direction of this uh, of the field B prime, and we will be able to rotate uh, the polarization. However, and this is this is known as an adiabatic transition or adiabatic rotation. However. If we change the direction of the magnetic field really abruptly, really quickly, then the neutron speed cannot follow the field change. And they will stay, they will align in regards to the, the previous uh, magnetic field, which here is denoted as B, anti-parallel to it. For the flippers, 
for example, the methyl clipper, we have this type of transition, the non-adiabatic transition. So here's a, uh, an, a simple scheme of the methyl clipper where we have our incident beam. We have this square structure that would be the coil, so that would be the flipper. And we would have then our incident beam with the spin that are, uh, that are parallel to the magnetic field BG before entering the coil. When they enter the coil, they experience the field of, they experience a new field because there is a field within the coil that is, of course, also uh, influenced by the field outside of it. And this, this entry into this new field will change the direction of the spin. Now, if we have the correct coil thickness, then the neutron spin can be cut outside of the field with 180 rotation with 180 rotation, so it will go from parallel to anti-parallel to our field BG. And this is a way that we can spin, uh, the, that we can flip the spin of our neutrons. It is just important to, to mention at this in this particular example that here for this scheme, I'm showing a 180 degree rotation. However, a pi two rotation can be done also. So a 90 degree rotation, so it is not always uh, necessary that this whole one, uh, 180 degree rotation is done. Another example of a flipper is a drafting flipper. Here we have uh, we have two magnetic fields that are coming from two from a set of coils. The magnetic fields are in opposite direction, and the fields cancel midway. If we see the second scheme where we can follow the with the small arrows the direction of the magnetic vector fields of the coils. We see that in the middle, this is where we the, the fields are canceled, and this is where the flipping, the spin flip occurs. And they go out of the coil, uh, they go out of the coil with the of the coil out with the spin flip. So how can we use our polarized beam and our flippers? to actually analyze samples. So at first, uh, and, and one of the simplest methods are, is the flipping ratio method. This method is used to derive magnetic structure factors and spin density distribution in ferromagnetic materials. And it is done by calculating the flipping ratio of our sample. The flipping ratio here, R, is the relation between the intensity of our neutrons in the par in the up state or in the state parallel to the field over the intensity of the neutrons with our spin that is anti-parallel to the field. And the structure factor is derived from the equation from the relation between gamma and R, which in this case we gamma it would be the ratio between the magnetic and the nuclear structure factors. So from the experiment that I will show in the next slide, uh, from the experiment, we know the flipping ratio, we know the nuclear structure factor is known, and this is how we can derivate the magnetic structure factor. So to show a scheme of how the, the experimental setup would look, we have uh, we have an incident beam, neutron beam, which is polarized, and we have only one flipper before our sample. So if our flipper is, if the flipper is off, then we measure the intensity of this, of the, of the neutrons, of the scattered neutrons with our spin parallel to the field. If we turn off the flipper, then we can measure, measure the intensity of the scattered neutrons with the spin anti-parallel to the field, and this is how we could calculate the ratio. Now, there are, of course, uh, other methods for polarized neutron scattering. The first one is uniaxial polarization analysis, or for short, UPA. In this analysis, the neutron spin is polarized and al analyzed along the same axis. Because and here it also is important to say that polarization is the, the polarization is a vector and is not just, it has components in the y and z axis, y, x, y, and z axis. 
So in this uniaxial polarization an analysis, we measured this polarization vector along the same axis, whereas on spherical neutron polarimetry, we can measure all three Cartesian components of this polarization vector. So as I just mentioned, uh, for UPA, the polarization can be set along X, Y, or Z. And the outgoing polarization, once it has been scattered by the sample, uh, is analyzed along this same direction. So in this, in this analysis, it is possible to measure four different scattering cross sections. The ones that are, uh, that have a spin flip and non spin flip. And I will show this, uh, I will exemplify it, uh, uh, late in the next slide, in the following slides. But we can measure, uh, the four different scattering cross sections. And if our polarization is parallel to the scattering vector, then we will only have nuclear contribution from the non spin flip cross sections. And this is how we are able to separate the nuclear and the, from the magnetic cross sections with this experiment. Now, the setup would look now like this. Different to the flipping uh, ratio method, we add a second flipper after the sample. In this first, in this first case, where both our flippers are on, I'm sorry, are off, then we would not have, of course, a spin flip and we would analyze, uh, the scattered, the scattered neutrons like this. Whereas if we turn one of the flippers, then we would have a spin flip, of course, and we would analyze them again. Uh, we would detect the, the scattered, uh, the scattered beam of the neutron beam. If we also, if we turn off the first flipper, but turn on the second flipper, again, we have a spin flip and we, and we measure this, uh, this cross section. And finally, if we turn on both flippers, then we, and we measure this, this final non spin flip cross section, then this is how we would get all our required cross sections to be able to make the analysis. So, the first two uh, to the left is shown the non-spin flip uh, cases where both the flippers are off. The spin flip for the spin flip cases, then we have one of the flippers on. Now, furthermore, if we come to spherical neutron polarimetry, uh, this technique is really powerful and is used to determine complex magnetic structures. In this case, the, polar the incident polarization can be set along one of the three Cartesian components. And the outgoing polarization, once it has been scattered, can be analyzed along either, again, along either X, Y, or Z. And you can measure all, then all three Cartesian components of the polarization vector. Which means that in spherical neutron polarimetry, we can actually have all the components of the polarization tensor. Whereas with the uniaxial uh, technique, we are only measuring the polarization vector in this, in the diagonal of our, of our, of the tensor shown here of the matrix. So this is a much more robust uh, technique. The only, the one of, one limitation of this technique or one thing that needs to be carefully, uh, control is that the incident and scattered guide fields have to be independent of each other. And for this, there is a nice, uh, a nice, uh, equipment that was developed at ILL called the cryopad, which is a cryogenic polarization analysis device. What this ensures is that the chamber where the, where the sample is located, is almost at a zero, has almost no magnetic field. And with this, we make sure that the, on, the change in the polarization is only due to that of the scattering of the sample. So if we see the three, the three techniques we've talked about today, uh, the first one being the flipping ratio method with the flipping ratio method, what we can do is we can derive magnetic form factors or we can derive spin density distributions 
With the uniaxial polarization analysis, we measure the four spin state cross sections, and with this, we can separate uh, nuclear and magnetic cross sections. And finally, with the spherical neutron polarimetry, we can measure the cross section of the neutron spin along any direction, and this is used for more complex magnetic structures. So with this, I come to the end of my talk. I would like to thank, of course, all the experts that helped us along uh, to build the presentation and explaining all difficult concepts of neutron, uh, of neutron polarization. And these are some of the references I used for this presentation. So from here, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. And I think we can then go to some questions.